evening, dear Professor Kate Jeffrey. I am greeting you in our framework of our project City as a Classroom. Could you compare a cell or human organism with a city or architecture? You could compare a cell with a city. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, there are similarities. So both are very complex. Um, both are built from raw materials. Um, both have a mixture of places where things are stored and um, channels by which things are moved around and so on. Um, they both serve to um, support something bigger than themselves. So the cell is in our body is supporting our body. A city is supporting you know, the human race. <laughs> so yes, there are similarities. Let's imagine a city as a living organism, and that it's not entirely healthy. Uh, what should be treated first of all? The problem with cities. So cities exist to um, bring together people so that they can exchange goods and ideas and you know, meet each other and so on. And cities have this tendency to grow and as they grow, they then need infrastructure to make them work. So you need roads, you need transport systems, you need sewage systems and so on. And the bigger they, they get, um, the harder it is to supply those needs. And eventually, I think cities get to a size where the transport system and the supply systems are dominating. So if you look at... Um, a big modern city like London, for example, the thing that strikes you most is that it's just roads, roads and motorways and flyovers and cars and <clears throat> all of these things exist to just transport people around, you know, trains. You know. Um, and I think ultimately that's unhealthy. So we see a similar thing in biological systems like cancers, for example, that grow and grow and grow. And then eventually they start to, the, the middle starts to decline because the the new growth can't support itself and perhaps that's not the best example because a cancer is inherently a bad thing but i think there is a problem <clears throat> that as as things like that grow it becomes harder and harder to meet the needs of the um center and the surround and i don't think we've done a very good job in resolving that so we have not been thinking how do we supply the center of our cities in a way that doesn't just destroy their um fabric you know, as places, places of quality to live. So, you know, we're discovering now with the lockdown, now that people are not traveling, not commuting, people are rediscovering um, how nice it is to stay local and to stay small. And I think um, that's something to, for us to reflect on. How do you think the city influences the psyche and mentality of the people? People are very drawn to cities. Um, and that is why they grow over time. So I think cities do meet a lot of our needs psychologically and physically. So physically, we go to cities because we can get work and that enables us to earn money and buy food and all the rest of it. But it also um, delivers a very rich culture. Like we meet other humans and interact with them and we discover the richness and joy of other people's creativity and so on. So, so it can be very... Um, beneficial to the to the psyche but um, they're also very stressful and we see high levels of mental illness in urban environments and um, we see deprivation we see pollution um, we see just things like large class sizes in schools like this constant uh, competition for resources that is that creates its own stress commuting um, getting back to transport again is, is extremely stressful. So, uh, so I think cities, um, they have positive and negative stresses. Uh, speaking about of, uh, symbolism, how do you think the ancient architecture builds the ancestors affect the consequences of uh, people? So, I mean, I should say that I'm not an expert on ancient history or <laughs> architecture. I'm a neuroscientist. Um, but I do know that you know 
that early cities formed organically. So they started off as small settlements and then they, um, they got bigger and bigger and, and um, they tended to form in a, in a fairly unplanned and uncontrolled way. Whereas modern cities often um, are planned. So architects will sit down and say, right, we're going to build a new town for our increasing population and we're going to build the cities like the, the, the roads like this and there's going to be a nice grid and we're going to have um, this sort of layout that's very logical. And um, I think the experiences of people living in an old style city versus a planned city are that the, the old style city that just grew is a more pleasant and, um, I don't know, enriching experience. Whereas um, modern cities that have been designed lack, lack a lot of that. And I think um, we need to think about why that is and what is it that we're failing to put into our plans that's failing to d deliver a, a fully pleasant experience. What you can uh, could recommend it to architects and developers uh, so that people can better navigate in city? So, yeah, so navigation, that's what I research as a yeah. neuroscientist. So I'm interested in how the brain processes the information from the eyes and, and the other senses and works out where you are and then helps you figure out how to get from where you are to some other place. And so I've become very interested in the architecture of cities because I, I live in London and I'm constantly trying to navigate around London and constantly finding it very difficult. And so I've started to think, what is it about these large buildings, these train stations or these hospitals or conference centers, or why are they so difficult to navigate around? And so I've been trying to um, take what we've learned about the neuroscience of navigation and think about how um, how our brains, the information that our brains are being given when we go into a designed building. And I think one of the problems with um, the architecture of large buildings and complex buildings is that the um, layout of the building doesn't give our brains the information that we need to be able to know, for example, which way round we're facing. Um, or what's the relationship of this room that I'm in at the moment to this other room that I was in a moment ago. So I think we make it very difficult for our brains to keep track of where we are as we're moving around. And then that makes us more reliant on signs and um, sort of artificial aids to navigation, which our brains do not evolve to use. And so we don't use them very easily. Uh uh, can we compare maybe a uh, navigation like a uh, seaman in the in the sea, maybe in the ocean on the ship? Yeah. Uh, if you know in the uh, is history, we have uh, much more um, moments when some city, maybe like uh, Palermo or Venice, uh, built like a ship, and there people uh, live and also uh, like on a ship, actually. Uh, so, uh, can we compare this is a navigation uh, system in brain in people uh, on these uh, two different uh, ways? I'm not sure I fully understood the last bit of, of that. So, can we compare the navigation system in the brain to n navigation on, on a ship? Yeah, like this. You mean, are there similarities? Yes, maybe like uh, some model. Is steering body like steering a ship? Yeah. In in some senses, so I mean that in some ways the problem that needs to be solved is the same. It's it's where are you, and which way are you facing, and where is your destination, and therefore which direction do you need to go to get to your destination? So so that's the same problem for you trying to figure out how to get out of your house and down to the front gate, or trying to steer a ship across the ocean. It's, there are similarities. So you need to have a compass in both cases. That's the most important thing of all. It's because you can't navigate without knowing which way you're facing, otherwise you go off in the wrong direction. So that's absolutely critical. And I think um, 
getting back to architecture, I think that's one of the things that architecture has not really fully um, thought about, um, which is when you when somebody goes into a building and moves around, how do they know which way they're facing? Like what information do they have? And you know, it, we often make it quite difficult for people. So they, you know, we don't have a magnetic sense. So we're not like um, birds or turtles or, or, or things. We don't have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. So we're reliant on um, being able to look around and recognize our surroundings. That's how we know which way around we're facing. Or, using these days we use our phones as well <laughs> but um you know the, the building for the building to be easy to navigate it needs to be the case that you can look up and you think i know exactly which way i'm facing because i don't know that's there's the big glass wall that i know is only on one side of the building or, or something like that um so a church is, is a typically a very easy building to navigate because it's very it has a very strong directionality you know there's something big doors at the other end and so on so um, that it's very easy to remain oriented in a church, even if it's got a lot of little compartments. Whereas something like a, um, an airport terminus that's very rectangular, sometimes you just get confused about which way around you're facing. So yeah, you need a compass. Yeah, if we, if we talk about compass like an instrument, yeah, which uh, maybe seamen use in, a sea, in the sea, uh, what uh, things is de depends in our brain for this compass in our life in, in the city? So we have we have a compass in our brains. So that's one of the big discoveries of the last um, few years. Could you please um, describe this as a model? It's very interesting. Yeah. So so it's it, it's slightly hard to describe for somebody who's not used to thinking. Um, in the abstract way that that, um, that the brain works. So it's not the case that you could look into the brain and you see something, you know, that, that's pointing <laughs> in a direction. What, um, what we see when we look into the brain is the activity of neurons um, and, and they're just firing nerve impulses and we're just kind of listening to these nerve impulses and trying to understand what the neurons are saying. And what has been found is that there are neurons in some parts of the brain that become very, very active when you face in a particular direction. So, and, and different neurons um, become active for different directions. So if I face one way, suddenly one of these neurons will become really, really active. If I turn my head um, and face in a different direction, that neuron will stop and a new one will start um, and it will become really, really active and so on. So whichever direction I'm facing, there'll be some of my neurons active. And so we think those neurons are acting a bit like a compass and um, telling other parts of the brain which way you're facing, basically. So they're called head direction cells. And they're found right throughout the brain in quite a lot of regions in the brain. So we think they're very important for lots of different things, not just for navigation, maybe for um, sensory perception as well, just making sense of what you can see. Um, it can help to know which way you're facing to be able to interpret what you're seeing. So, um, so it's a, it was a very exciting discovery. And um, it's something that my lab has been quite interested in for a long time, is how do these head direction cells know which way you're facing? What, what information do they use? I know you are uh, born in uh, New Zealand, yeah? Uh, can you compare uh, maybe uh, mentality in New Zealand and in London, with uh, maybe uh, some difference or similarities in terms of how people navigate. Yes, also. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, I grew up in a um, city. It's called Dunedin. Um, it's, it's in the far south, and it is um, well, like many cities in New Zealand, it's very hilly, like but very um, steep hills. Um, leading down to this flat region that surrounds the harbour. So um, there's very strong um, topography. Like if you just look around you and you're in the city, you can see there's that, I can see the harbour over there, there's the big hill over there, there's another hill over there. Um, so it's very easy to remain oriented. Whereas in London, 
um, if I look around me, I can see just buildings. You know, there's a building, there's another building, there's another building. They all look the same. You know? <laughs> I really have no, no idea which way I'm facing. I can't see the sun because it's always cloudy in London. Um, <clears throat> I, I just um, am pretty lost. So I think, I think um, that type of living environment does affect how people navigate. So if you live in a city where it's very easy to work out um, which way you're facing, then you probably rely more on natural navigation. If you live in a city that's very flat, you're constantly in these, what they call urban canyons, like, you know, just a, um, a street with buildings on either side, like a canyon. Um, and it's very difficult to navigate, and then you become reliant on technology, like like smartphones or signposts or things like that. So um, I had a you know the frequent experience when I was in London in the early days when I'd I'd be lost and I'd say to a passerby, "Can you tell me which way north is?" And they would look at me as if I was mad, like you know, why would you ask that, and and why would I know the answer to that? Whereas where I came from, you you just knew, you know. Um, so yeah, so it's people's life experiences, I think, do affect how they how they navigate. Uh, can, you, can you please uh, tell which city uh, maybe the hard uh, for navigation to navigate people? Yeah, I mean it depends on um, what navigation aids you have. So a lot of American cities are, are laid out on a on a sort of a grid, and. Um, in some senses, that's easy because you just need to know the street number, um, of, you know, the, the two streets, what the, the east, west and the north, south um, kind of um, axes. And then you can just work it out by logic. But that's not navigation in the natural sense. So navigation in the natural sense is, is quite difficult in a, in a grid city because everything kind of looks the same. The streets all run parallel. and. Um, there's, there's often not a lot of topography. So, you know, often a lot of these big cities in the Midwest and so on are quite flat. So, so that can be quite difficult. London, um, London is confusing for a different reason, which is that it, um, it doesn't have a grid, um, but it does have something that looks a little like a grid. So, and the, there's this tendency for people to, um, in their minds, to sort of straighten out things that are not quite straight. So for example, um, a lot of people, when they're thinking about London, think of the Thames as being, you know, the River Thames as being um, an, an orienting feature. And in their mental map, the Thames runs from, from west to east across London. But actually, it doesn't. It, it, it does quite a lot of um, twisting and curving. So if you zoom out a long, long way, it's true, it runs kind of east to west. But, you know, when you're up close, it's, it's actually doing a, a lot of this. And, um, so a lot of people run into difficulty because they're thinking of the, of the river as being a, um, an east-west thing, but actually the bit of London that they're in, it's running north-south. And so there's things like that. And, and um, streets, often you have a similar situation. There'll be a street that starts out running east-west, but it gently curves, and you're not aware of it because it's over a long distance. But at some point, it's actually now running north-south, and you haven't quite realized, and so you haven't um, set your compass properly. And then it can take a long time to straighten out those mistakes that you've made and so on. So it can be confusing, mm -hmm. um, especially because you can't, can't see hill, hills or anything um, from, from the middle. Could you please tell about your last uh, research with in a neurological brain, our little brains? Yeah, so I've, um, I've been looking at um, how, how the brain works out fairly simple um, aspects of space, like so sort of which direction you're facing, I've mentioned that, um, but also how far you've walked um, and where you are. So, so these, these three things that are kind of important for navigation. And the, there are cells in the brain, these were the first ones to be discovered actually in the navigation system, that become active um, if the animal, so we study, we study rats and mice, um, if the animal goes to a particular place. So we may be walking around a box and every time it goes into this particular corner of the box, one of these cells will become really active. Uh, and so a lot of the work of my lab has been trying to understand how does that cell 
know that the rat is in the south east corner of the box you know what information does it get and so you can do things like you can stretch or um, squeeze the box or you can rotate it or you can change the color of it or you can just do things and you can play around with it and and see how the cells react to that and that helps you figure out what what information they're using and then you can um, try and trace where does that information come from um, eventually it comes back to the eyes and the um, vestibular system you know and so on um, so I've been looking at that and then um, more recently there have been discovered some cells that seem to track how far the animal has walked. So they'll become active if the animal is in a place. And then when the animal walks away from that place, it'll become quiet. But as the animal keeps walking, one of these cells will suddenly become active again. And then it'll become quiet. And then it'll become active again. And these places where it becomes active are very, very regularly spaced. And so the cell somehow knows that the rat has walked 30 centimeters or, or whatever, or a meter or whatever that cell is interested in. And then when these cells were discovered, we just were amazed, like how does this work and, and what are they for? Um, so it seems they're called grid cells. And, and the reason is that if you um, plot these little patches of activity on a sort of piece of paper, um, they form this very regular pattern that looks like a grid. And we sort of thought, maybe they're acting like a grid on a map. So that's their function, is to act like the grid lines on a map and to tell the brain how far apart things are in space. So I've been um, interested in all of these cells. And one of the things I've been looking at is whether they, they work in uh, three dimensions. So not just as you walk around on the flat, but what happens if you go up? Um, are these cells also measuring distances and marking up locations and, and tracking direction and vertical space as well. Uh, one more question, please. Uh, could you describe how uh, social uh, lives, social uh, networks, I mean, influences also in our brain in, in a neurobiological level I mean, for, for, for now? Yes, we, um, we don't know as much about social processing yet. So, so there are um, quite a few parts of the brain that are processing social information. So, you know, for example, is there another creature around? And if there's another creature, is it the same species as me? Um, and is it a threat? And, and so on and so on. So, you know, the brain is very interested in who else is around. And Recently, it's become apparent that the part of the brain that cares about space, so the navigation center, also cares about who is, who is in the vicinity, like who is where. Um, and it may go even further than that. It may be also that um, we use that same spatial mapping system to map out our social relationships. So for example, if I think of my ancestors, you know, I, I sort of think of my parents and then my grandparents are above them and then my great grandparents are above them. So I'm sort of using a spatial map to think about my ancestors. Um, and similarly with my friends, I've got, you know, my close friends and I've got another friend. And those two friends know each other, but that, that person doesn't know those people, but they know, you know. And so you could, um, you could think of all of your um, social network also in a, tight, in a sort of a spatial way. And so people are now starting to think maybe this part of the brain that does mapping for when we walk around space, maybe it also is mapping other types of information in this more abstract domain, like, like social, making social maps, or maybe maps of um, color or maps of sounds or, or you know, other, other types of maps. So there's a lot of interest at the moment in exploring those ideas to see if this, is, um, this navigation system does a lot more than just space. Uh, how far research progress, progressed uh, over the past uh, 100 years I mean, in uh, neurobiological and physical? Yeah, uh, in some ways it's made uh, huge strides. Um, but also, sometimes I go back and I look at the things that were said by the scientists of 100 years ago or 120 years ago and think, wow, you know, they had such incredible insights that we still, we still believe those things today. And 
So we sometimes forget that despite the lim more limited technology, those people were just as smart. And um, so many of the most important ideas that we deal with today, those ideas came, came about many decades ago. Um, but modern technology has, has enabled us to ask a lot of questions. So we've been able to study the activity of single neurons. That's been just an incredible um, advance. And that advance began about the, the middle of last century. Um, and then in the last few decades, we've developed the ability to um, not just to massively increase how many of these neurons we can look at, but also to manipulate them. So to actually be able to reach in and selectively say, okay, I'm going to um, activate these, these neurons or I'm going to silence these ones. Um, what effect is that going to have? Um, and it's got to the stage now where scientists are doing things like implanting memories into mice. Uh, you know, very, sim very simple memories at the moment, but still it's, it was a, um, it's an accomplishment that we couldn't have even imagined 40 or 50 years ago. It's just extraordinary how much the technology has advanced. So it's a pretty exciting field to be in. And what would you like to add, maybe? Anything? I mean, one of the other sort of interesting things about the brain and architecture is emotion. Um, and in fact, architects, that, that tends to be the first thing they think of. So um, architects really are motivated by trying to create an experience in people's minds, so an emotional experience. They want people to feel wonder or awe or, you know, just to be, um, or pleasure, you know. Um, and so the idea that how people think in space, like, you know, as with navigation, for example, I think that's a, possibly a more recent idea for architects. So emotion comes very naturally to architects, thinking um, less naturally. But I think those two things go together. And in fact, I think um, that how people think about space also affects how they feel about space. So for example, if a space is confusing and difficult to understand and difficult to navigate around, um, then I think people probably feel less good in that space. So ultimately, you know, the brain, the, the cognitive parts of the brain and the emotional parts of the brain, they talk to each other a lot. And I think with architecture, we need to take that into consideration and to think um, how, how is a person going to be able to think in the space and how they're going to feel in the space and um, what is it we want to achieve with our architecture in terms of that? Do we want to make people feel calm or stimulated or anxious or surprised or, you know, um, all of those things. Thank you.